today uh, the speaker is, our speaker is Alex Huck, uh, who's a member of the Department of Neuroscience, also a member of the Department of Psychology. And he uh, is also, are you the director yet? Center for, Pre let's, no. He's also a member of the Center for Perceptual Systems. So I have to tell you just, uh, you know, nobody wants to listen to the long academic introduction, but I can tell you this, uh, Alex is one of the very best. He's, uh, and, I can, and I can prove that to you because universities keep trying to steal him away. And uh, so far, uh, we, we've, uh, fortunately Austin's a nice place to live, but Alex is one of the very best at what he does. And uh, he's gonna tell you a nice tale today where he tells you a little bit about his research, uh, but then how in unexpected ways uh, that research found its way to important clinical and practical applications. So when Alex is done, I'll pop up, we'll, uh, our volunteers will answer the, uh, grab your questions and we'll uh, go into the Q&A, okay? So thank you, Alex. Hi folks, uh, thanks Mike. Uh, yeah, I'm Alex. Uh, I hope you like puzzles, uh, I do. And that's pretty much what we're gonna talk about for the next 45 minutes or an hour. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I am really a just unabashed, out and proud, curiosity-driven researcher. Uh, what what wakes me up in the morning, what brings me into the lab, what keeps me there um, are puzzles. And so uh, you may be wondering now, almost certainly by the end of the talk, uh, why I would be giving a, a public lecture about uh, potential clinical and real life applications of basic research. Uh, you know, one of my running lines is that uh, I'm not that kind of doctor. Uh, and, and so what I wanna do in the first few minutes is actually just sort of unpack a little bit about uh, uh, my general sort of interest, but also sort of how this stuff uh, uh, with, with respect to basic research and, and real life applications, I think fit together in, in a nice way that, that might not be intuitive for people who, who aren't really on the front lines of either doing science or of turning things into clinical applications. Uh, I'll also just mention at the beginning that I am absolutely happy to field uh, questions as I'm going. I know we have a well-structured MC'd discussion at the end, but if, if you want a clarification on something, uh, uh, as soon as they get those lights turned down a little bit, uh, I'll be able to see you, and uh, th then I'm happy to uh, field a raised hand question. All right, so, you know, in, in general, uh, I study uh, how the brain processes visual information, and uh, how other parts of the brain uh, take that visual information and use it to guide very simple types of motor behaviors, uh, primarily eye movements, all right? And, uh, you know, th th there's many reasons why, why this is, a, I think, an interesting and important area of study. I'm gonna walk you through a bit right now. Um, what I'm showing you here is a sort of canonical primate brain. This would actually be the brain of a rhesus monkey. It's a really nice model for that of the human. Uh, and here's an eye just to give you a sense of where the front of the head would be, okay? So we know a lot about the visual system of primates. So uh, the back of the brain over here is called V1 or primary visual cortex. And this is really like a multi-purpose, almost just analyzer of the visual input that is sent from the eyes through the thalamus to the back of the head, okay? Now, I actually focus on a um, uh, sub part of vision. Uh, uh, primarily, I focus on, on how we see things move, okay? And in fact, we, we know a huge amount about how the brain does this. For example, the neurons in primary visual cortex are the first individual neurons that actually carry information about the direction of motion, okay? So for example, you have photoreceptors in your eyes. They send a signal to the brain if light falls upon them or not, uh, but they don't care what direction the, the pattern of light might be as it moves across the retina, all right? The brain has to figure it out again from what are effectively little pixels in the back of the eye, all right? 
And so the neurons in primary visual cortex actually begin this process of reconstructing the visual motion signal. So I'm sort of showing you here two examples of what individual neurons in this part of the brain might sort of register. And really what they do is they just sort of extract a little tiny bit of rather dumb information, okay? This neuron over here would be saying, well, if I happen to be seeing, I'm using that in scare quotes, an oriented bar moving down into the right, I will fire some more signal, uh, you know, action potentials. I will send a signal to later parts of the brain. And its neighbor neuron over here might be looking only for gratings that are oriented 45 degrees like this and that happen to be moving up into the right. And only then will that neuron send a signal to later parts of the brain to be used, okay? They are essentially blind to any other stuff out there in the world, and they don't really talk to one another, so they don't put it together. They just sort of say, hey, here's what I'm seeing, and that's all. I can just tell you this, it's very ambiguous, okay? So what's really beautiful, and one of the things that sort of just as a puzzle just caught my eye when, when I was an early graduate student um, was that there's another part of the brain a little further along the visual pathways called MT, or the middle temporal area. It's my favorite thing in the world. And neurons in MT almost exclusively receive those ambiguous, somewhat stupid motion signals from primary visual cortex and put them together, okay? So, so there's this really, really beautiful sort of um, explication of the direction of motion of complex objects and patterns uh, based on very simple uh, sort of deconstructed signals coming from primary visual cortex. All right, and I'd be happy to walk you through in, in uh, slightly less uh, public settings the, the sort of detailed understanding of, of that, that uh, sort of pathway. Instead, I just wanna kind of keep moving through the pathway. So I got really interested in this area MT when I, when I was a graduate student, primarily because it wasn't just being understood with respect to simple visual processing, it was, its activity was also being linked to perception in very direct ways. So it was studied extensively uh, by a group of researchers, really starting in the 1990s, uh, who, who uh, uh, probed its function using displays like this. And so hopefully you're looking at this stuff here. It looks like twinkly dots. Uh, and the dots sometimes are clearly moving in one direction or another, say up, down, left, or right. Uh, but sometimes it's really unclear what direction they're moving in, okay? And, and that's the point we can manipulate the direction of motion with this stimulus. So sort of, you know, uh, changing the nature of the signal that the brain is trying to extract. And we can also make it easier or hard, right? We can titrate the strength of that signal. And so uh, the thing that really, really just, you know, be became a, a, a puzzle that, that I wanted to work on for, for now decades is the fact that individual neurons in this brain area MT have been shown quantitatively uh, to be sensitive enough to explain our perception, okay? So, so the signals there are not just selective for direction. You can really, really dig in in a detailed way and, and find that their individual responses have a lot of quantitative or statistical relationship to our perceptual capabilities, okay? What was even more striking is that in animal model systems, people would go in and just turn on a few of these neurons at a time and they would exert subtle but systematic effects on the behavior or the perception that was going on at the same time, okay? So th this really nailed it for me. This is the part of the brain that does something that we understand in detail and that seems to be really, really a hub in, f in terms of how the brain processes stuff. This is the little chunk of brain that any other part of the brain looks to if it needs to know what direction of motion something is moving in, okay? Great. So there were even braver investigators sort of egged on by these initial results who moved on further along in the visual pathways and started recording from neurons in an area known as LIP. Don't worry about what that stands for. Um, and the neurons in LIP actually are also selective for the direction of motion, but in fact, they don't just tell us what is up on, say, a computer screen in front of a subject who's viewing these dots. 
they really have these interesting dynamics over time. And so in fact, the responses of the neurons gradually sort of work their way up or down. And they do that on a time scale and with a lot of other quantitative detail that uh, I won't bore you with, that really makes them look like the brain's manifestation of forming a decision about the direction of motion. In other words, if you're looking at stuff and it's really difficult, it's really hard to tell what direction these things are moving in, those responses meander very gradually, say, upward or downward. But if it's really easy and obvious, these are the neurons that are quickly going up or down. Okay. And so again, this was a really neat puzzle. I found it really compelling. Uh, you could even then start building mathematical explanations that link the activity of these neurons to the behavior in much more detailed ways than those early studies of MT. Okay? So you might actually posit that when that activity level of some of these neurons in the back of the parietal lobe hits some level, that is the brain making up its mind. Okay? That is the brain saying, I have had enough time to accumulate enough evidence to decide that this is rightward motion. And I am now going to tell those other parts of the brain that are also studied well to make a behavioral response communicating that that per percept has, has really been finalized, all right? And so, you know, in, in rather technical but uh, compelling work, one could take the activity of these neurons and link them to the time and the accuracy of decisions made by either humans or animal models as a function of the difficulty of, of that stimulus, okay? And again, if you're sitting here thinking like, is there gonna be a quiz and wait a sec, what's going on in MT? Don't worry. Here's why I found that compelling. Hopefully you will too. We had a circuit in the brain that goes from the world back out to the world and we knew a few stops along the way where something really critical in that information transmission occurred, okay? The stuff out there in the world that I call the input are those visual motion displays I've been talking about, in this case, dots of some direction and of some difficulty to discern. We could uh, understand the activity of neurons that were figuring out direction in a very basic sense, the really key hub that integrates that information about what's out there in the world. And then another part of the brain that says, well, for this task, I need to make a decision and I need to make an appropriate behavioral response. So let me figure that out and, and mull it over. And that's what this parietal area seems to do. And so we could go all the way back out to the behavioral response. Okay, So for me, that was sort of like an engineer would, would, would want uh, a, a fairly detailed mathematically rigorous explanation of how the brain transformed signals from the world back to a behavior, okay? So what I'm gonna do today is talk about a few lines of research that uh, I've worked on uh, over the years. Uh, I'm gonna focus primarily sort of some on stuff in the middle um, related to how we see visual motion and very simple ways that we might move our eyes. And, you know, I want to be really, really frank about this stuff. I do this because I just love it. I love solving these puzzles. Um, but what's been really fun over the years is that I realized I'd sort of amassed a whole bunch of contacts with people in far more translational or clinical domains who had actually touched base with me about some of this very basic research and who are either using it in ways that uh, I find you know, sort of gratifying because they're experts in turning this basic knowledge in, into applications, uh, or, or in itself actually have, have pushed other interesting basic research questions back to us, all right? Um, this is also my attempt to finally sort of make peace with my mother's criticism uh, of going to uh, you know, a PhD program to study seemingly esoteric random dots. Uh, and so, you know, she's always said, you know, you look, you see, why can't you be a real doctor? Uh, and, and, and so, you know, at least some of my friends are real doctors now. So in, in, the, in the first part of the talk, um, which uh, will be the longest and the most technical, so feel free to interrupt, um, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you see things move in 3D, okay? So in fact, 
all that stuff I talked about that I view as sort of the canon of, you know, sort of the primate visual system was all done for convenience um, uh, using flat computer screens, okay? So nothing was really moving towards or away or through depth, okay? It's artificial, but easily tractable, easy to control, okay? Nowadays, treating a computer screen as pretty much your entire uh, environment is, is seemingly increasingly natural. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that in the second part, uh, which is uh, uh, <clears throat> a little briefer. I'll talk about how um, we move our eyes in response to visual motion. And sorry about all the quotes up here, but in general, I'm gonna be trying to uh, sort of convince you that uh, what feels like totally volitional, natural, wild sort of viewing of a scene turns out to be very lawful, okay, in the scientific sense of being reliable and predictable and easily understood. And it turns out that people think that that's actually a useful thing outside of just uh, sort of keeping me interested. Um, then, if we've got the time, uh, and if you're good, uh, we'll, we'll do something fun. Uh, and so my daughter in the audience is probably having a flashback to a road trip we, we just had where it's pretty much what I said for 300 miles. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to start out actually not just by talking about visual motion. I like it, in fact. I like visual motion because in about five minutes I can get some of my new friends to generally understand how the brain does it, okay? Instead, what I need to do now is explain just a little, little bit of binocular vision, okay? And, you know, I've been doing this stuff for 25 years. I, I, I know I study a technical and esoteric sub, sub, sub area of neuroscience. I find binocular vision to be esoteric and highly technical, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do the best I can. This is your real uh, sort of primo opportunity to tell me I'm not being clear enough, okay? Um, but in fact, I think we all have some intuition for how binocular vision works, okay? Uh, uh, I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that some of you were, were adults in the 1990s when the magic eye fad hit, okay? Um, these were um, uh, bargain books at Barnes & Noble. Uh, these were posters in high schoolers' uh, uh, bedrooms. And uh, they were very, very popular for a few years. And, and they're, they're unintuitive, but in fact, they are a great example of how we use our two eyes to extract depth, okay? Um, and so, in fact, they were so popular, there was a sequel, Magic Eye 2, and it, it's like the Godfather movies. Even the third one is great. Uh, I have these all, and, and, and I review them frequently. Um, so, so here's, here's a, a, um, a, a sort of proto-magic eye. You may remember these, right? You would have to somehow cross your eyes looking at what looked like a textured pattern. And if you got it just right, you'd see like a dolphin, okay? And that, that was the, the, the big win, okay? Uh, here's how they work. The, the, this is sort of halfway to a magic eye. Uh, what you can see in the background here is just a grid, okay? And that grid is actually really important. You'll notice then that there are repeating objects. This could actually just be a texture, which I'll show you on the next slide, okay? But it's a little more intuitive. If you have, say, this tiger in the middle row, uh, here's, of course, a, a, a well-known photo of Dr. Mock riding a shark, uh, and, and that's me on a tiger. Uh, so you'll notice, relative to the grid, that the horizontal position of the shark is shifting slightly from row to row, right? So the nose is a little to the right, and by over here, the nose is a little to the left, and so on, okay? So here's the trick that the magic eye exploits, and it's actually the same trick that now modern 3D movies exploit as well, just with a little bit more apparatus between you and the screen. Here's the deal. You're supposed to cross your eyes. You know that, right? You remember this from, uh, from, from the magic eye days. What that really means is that you are forcing your brain not to point both eyes at, say, one of these squares, but instead to point one eye to this square and another eye to this square, okay? That's what the crossing of the eyes is doing, all right? And so all that does is it gives the brain slightly different copies, horizontally shifted, of basically the same stuff. 
And that is actually a cheat for what the brain actually encounters when you're looking at a three-dimensional world, a truly three-dimensional world. Your eyes, left and right, are about six centimeters apart. And so we all know that they see slightly different views of the world, that's just geometry, and that these views of the world are horizontally shifted. You can remind yourself by looking in a mirror or by holding your thumb and doing the usual game of alternatingly opening and closing your left and right eyes, okay? So your brain has this just wonderful algorithm. It just does this no matter what. Even if the rest of your brain knows, I'm just looking at a calendar and it's, it's a flat piece of paper, okay? Your brain says, oh, there's a little mismatch horizontally between the left eye's view of this shark and the right eye's view of this shark relative to this square. That means that shark is not on what we would call the plane of fixation. It might be a little further or a little closer, depending upon the sign of the difference. Don't worry about that. Okay, so if any of you are actually able to cross views, uh, you should have you know, this amazing experience of now seeing this shark uh, a little bit behind the screen, for example. All right, so that's what your brain is doing. It's making a horizontal comparison between the two eyes views. Good? Clear enough? We'll see. We'll see when we do the test at the end. Okay. So now uh, I'm going to show you a, a, a much more conventional magic eye. This, you'll now know, right? You, you're savvy enough to realize there's this repeated pattern. Okay. Now it's, it, now it's not Mike on the shark. It's just this textury stuff. Okay. Um, but in fact, you could do the same thing. You could point your left eye here and your right eye here. And there's a subtle geometric horizontal offset that's been inserted using a mathematical algorithm in a way that shapes sort of uh, the outline of an object, okay? So it, if anyone's doing this, this is not a great room for audience participation or for hoping we get to 100%. Uh, if, if, if you were to point your left eye here and your right eye here or vice versa, you would see the outline of a dog, okay? You're not missing much. All right. Um, but, you know, I, I actually want to flag something, and some people in the audience may remember this too, which is that magic eyes are really hard for some people. And, and I basically can't see magic eyes. Uh, I, I need a lot of help with them. I need to be told what the answer is. Sometimes someone can point at the edge, and then it starts to kind of build for me, right? My brain has to do some extra work. I don't get that all for free, okay? Um, and, and so uh, that's actually a little hint about clinical relevance that, that I like to drop in even when I give a, a, a sort of standard science talk, which is that this information is coming to your brain, but different people actually are using it slightly differently. It depends a lot on early visual experience in this particular case. I'm going to unpack that in a bit. All right. So the reason why these magic eyes are really hard is that they remove two normal sources of information, right? We remove the actual dog, okay? The dog is only specified by the depth. There is no actual dog to look at, right? I, I presume that's, that's clear for you. Um, the other thing is that that dog, unlike a real dog, is not moving at all. It is completely, perfectly stationary. Okay. So you, you, what's beautiful about, about these sorts of magic eye displays is that they're pure. They only rely on what we would call binocular disparities to extract the depth. Okay? But in the real world, your visual system has a richer menu. It has a few options. And I'm going to explain to you how, in fact, it turns out. Uh, we can rely on multiple sources of binocular information to figure out 3D worlds. So I'm going to get back to my um, uh, sort of safer place here. Uh, th this is a cartoon of uh, my dream experiment. It's, I, I love this stuff. Uh, this square in the center of the screen would just be something I would tell a subject to point their eyes to. Okay, Pretty exciting, I know. Um, and then these two dots here, they're just dots. And I might move them to the right. And on that particular trial, I might present them for half a second and then ask the subject what direction those dots moved in. And they might indicate that uh, direction by, say, pointing their eyes to the right or to the left. And I could use a device to measure that, and we'd be on to the next trial, okay? I know it's not for everyone, but, but trust me, uh, it's great. 
Um, so here, here's the deal, and, and I'm gonna come back to binocular vision now. Even this has a really interesting puzzle to it, okay? You might be thinking, you already told me how the brain does this, why do you keep studying this, okay? Um, you know, I, you told me there are neurons in primary visual cortex that might respond to rightward motion over here. There might be another neuron that sends the brain information about rightward motion here. That area MT then might sort of collate all that information over space and say, yeah, this is generally speaking rightward motion. That area in the parietal lobe, LIP, might say, yep, I'm listening to this for a few hundreds of milliseconds. I'm pretty sure that's rightward motion. Time to make the behavioral response, right? Here's the catch. This is highly artificial. Let me sort of take a step back and sh show you what normally is happening, even in very, very simple cases. You have two eyes. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, yeah, it's not a surprise anymore, but you have two eyes. Uh, and in fact, the majority of motions that you see in the real world are not left, right, up, down, purely, they have some component in the third dimension, okay? And in fact, when you move, you're primarily causing forward or backwards motions uh, with respect to the world, okay? So now let's imagine that that dot was a ball, okay? And that ball might be moving towards you, as might the black ball, okay? So given that you have two eyes, this screen here is no longer showing you what might be on the computer screen in my laboratory, but instead is showing you what the left eye and the right eye sort of see in a cartoon form, okay? And all I've done is drawn lines through the pupil to the screen to indicate roughly where this white ball would project onto the two eyes, like a screen, and where the black one would. And then I drew those red arrows to say what direction they would be moving, okay? So I just did, you know, middle school geometry. This turns out to be a great puzzle, right? Why? Here's how we would normally think about things. Say, okay, now that we're talking about two eyes, we totally switch gears, we go back to that world of binocular disparity. Ugh. Okay, so uh, look, these two copies of the eyes view of that white ball are in some relative horizontal positions, and as that ball sails towards the head, that binocular disparity is gonna change a little bit, okay? And so one might be able to see this move using this mechanism of depth perception that, that I walked you through. Basically doing a magic eye and then seeing how the magic eye is changing over time, okay? But in fact, if, 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 uh, if you're a motion person like I am, uh, you're gonna look at this and, and feel a little queasy and here's why. I remember l looking at a, a whiteboarded version of this and thinking, I don't understand how this works with what I know. Here's the puzzle. When this white spot, what white ball is moving towards you, it moves leftward in one eye's view and it moves rightward in another eye's view. That's actually pretty bad for us. All our understanding of how visual motion works never ever takes into account opposite directions of motion, somehow coming from the same object and how one would interpret that, okay? It was just a puzzle. It was just missing information even. I, to call it a puzzle is giving it too much credit, okay? Um, and, and so what's really neat here too is that if that white ball were to move away from you as opposed to towards you, the same general thing would happen. It's just that the directions of motion would flip in the two eyes, okay? In other words, the right eye's view of, of the motion and the left eye's view of the motion would generally have the same velocities, they would just flip, okay? And you can confirm this, again, by interrogating your visual system with your thumb. If you were to move your thumb towards and away, you can tell that. Why can you tell that? Because the right eye is seeing a certain direction of motion and the left eye is seeing an opposite direction of motion. And which eye is seeing which direction of motion matters, okay? That said, None of the stuff we knew about how the brain processes visual motion uh, took into account binocular viewing, and nothing that we understood about binocular viewing took into account the fact that things could move. And, you know, this is just how subfields work, right? You get focused on things, you get used to a certain sort of class of experiments and ways of doing the experiments. And, and so th this was just sort of, you know, a fun chat where we realized 
we should really try to link these two literatures. Okay? Uh, it just so happened UT is a, a really great place to do neuroscience, and in particular, a great place to do vision science. Uh, so I had to go a full two doors down to find one of the world's foremost experts in binocular vision. Uh, and, and so over the years, we've built a, a collaboration. I think we're about 15 years in. Um, and I'm going to summarize uh, the results of, of all that work uh, in about three slides. So, so let me zoom in a little bit more on, on uh, uh, the puzzle. We're going to try to take that cartoon and, and bring it almost into the laboratory for you. All right. This is what would be, what would be called a stereogram. Uh, magic eyes are called auto stereograms. Uh, you shouldn't look at them in cars. It just means that you can do it sort of by yourself, okay? With a regular stereogram, we're gonna use an apparatus to actually present things to the left and right eyes under control using, using other devices, okay? If you go see a movie uh, that's 3D, you'll be asked to put on uh, polarizing filters that are essentially um, uh, able to uh, listen to different bits of the light coming out of a projector that form differential images in the left and right eyes, right? These are the, the current technology that's winning is called real 3D, right? Um, in, in our case, we might use a mirror apparatus. It's, it's a little nicer for certain reasons, okay? But in general, we uh, bring people into the lab, we stick them in front of a whole bunch of mirrors, and this is what their left eye sees, and this is what their right eye sees, okay? So now that we've actually gone through, I can't believe I did a public lecture and I walked people through stereo vision. But now that we've done it, uh, you know, you should be able to see kind of what should be going on in this sort of simple laboratory display. If the subject points their eyes here or here, left eye is pointed here, right eye is pointed here, generally this stuff is the same, right? The brain will start to try to interpret it don't worry about the frame or these corner dots. Those are just there to sort of remind us where the edges of the screen are. The really big stuff going on here, the super exciting stuff, again, are my black and white dots, okay? So you'll notice that every white dot over here has a buddy in the other eye, but they might be horizontally shifted relative to one another a little bit and so on. So this black dot and this black dot, you can kind of get a sense they're probably coming from the same object, but they must be at some depth because they end up in the two eyes in slightly different locations. So in fact, if we were to present this to you, or you're welcome to free fuse it, if we have any old uh, microscope people here, uh, uh, you would have a percept that is kind of 3D, right? It would be depthy. Uh, so uh, these flat spots that we're just presenting to your two eyes would be interpreted by the brain as things that are not flat, that have actually managed to somehow poke off the screen or sink into it, all right? And again, this is just review of the simple binocular geometry that I've already explained to you. So likewise, if we start moving them, You'll note that I'm moving them in opposite directions in the two eyes, so that I'm kind of connecting back up to that 3D motion stuff we just talked about. Uh, your brain would interpret that properly, right? This is really just interpreting the geometric consequences of what happens when you have two eyes and a three-dimensional world. Right? So this is all fine. This is not surprising. Uh, we have stuff like this in the lab all the time that we sort of look at, we riff on. Uh, and I had a new postdoc uh, who was very interested in this topic. And, uh, you know, postdocs are, are, are scholars who have finished their PhD, so they know a lot. Um, and they're going to do a few years of training before they become an independent investigator and run their own lab. Uh, so what that means is, uh, boy, they know everything. And uh, you really, you know, you watch them grow into independence. And it's an interesting interpersonal sort of interaction. So in other words, we, we like to haze and torture uh, our postdocs. And so, so what I told this postdoc was, why don't you mess around with this in all sorts of ways? And, and he, he resisted, which, which, which was right. Um, but, but finally, he implemented one change. And it's going to sound weird to you, which is I said, why don't we, technical term would be, invert the contrast polarity. Basically, what that means is turn the dark dots in one eye into bright spots in the other eye, and vice versa, okay? So now, 
whatever is white in one eye is black in the other eye. This would be akin to looking at a 3D movie where the left eye is seeing a black and white photo and the right eye is seeing the photographic negative of that black and white photo. Okay. Again, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume some of you have seen pre-digital photos. So, um, you, know, you know, right? Uh, even looking with one eye at a, a photographic negative is a really weird experience, right? Clearly, your brain expects sort of certain things to be bright and certain things to be dark, and when they're flipped, it's hard to recognize things, recognize faces, etc. If you do this trick, where you present the photographic negative in one eye, it really, really messes with your depth of perception. In other words, if you were to look at this, you'd have no idea where those balls were in depth. Okay. You'd know that they were balls. In fact, for a lot of subjects, they'll view them as specular, in other words, mirror-like. Okay. So it's a little trippy. It's not that interesting, but you, you kind of have this percept of, I don't know where these things are, but they look shiny. That's weird. Right? The reason they look shiny is that, in fact, your brain is making a reasonable inference, which is when things are mirror-like, they reflect the light in very, very precise directions. And so the two eyes rarely, off a mirror, will get the same brightness. Okay? So, so that's the brain making a good guess. It has nothing to do with depth of perception, though. Okay? So you look at this, it looks horrible. I think my postdoc at the time you know, sort of looked o over his shoulder at me and said, like, see, you messed it up, I told you. Um, but here was the really cool thing. He started playing the animation. And then all of a sudden, these weird, undepthy mirror balls uh, were clearly moving towards our way. They seemed just as clear in terms of their direction in, in, in depth uh, as the regular display that is kosher and right that I showed you on the last slide was. Okay? So, so th this was actually a really neat illusion. It, I remember this moment fondly because, you know, there were three of us actually looking, free, crossing our eyes, looking at this display, and we realized we were sort of on to something and, and that there was a little bit more to this puzzle. Okay? So, so let me just show you one little smidge of data. This is the sort of experiment that, you know, uh, a motivated undergraduate could do in the lab, um, but uh, it really boils this all down. So imagine in the laboratory, we present those sorts of displays. And what we do is actually present not just that perfect, normal, what I would call correlated or interocularly corresponding, sorry, um, uh, first stereogram, or that horrible, completely photographic negative stereogram. But from trial to trial, we can sort of walk in between the two. So we can decide on each trial how many of those dots are correlated or are backwards, okay? And then we're gonna ask subjects to do a really simple task. We're gonna say, hey, uh, tell us whether some of those spots or dots were near or far. Easy, right? There's two alternatives. One of those answers is always right. This is not hard, um, unless we make it hard. And so in fact, if we measure the accuracy of human observers, they're really good when they're looking at a normal stereogram, but as we walk that stereogram down into that weird photographic negative terrain, they have a lot of trouble doing it. They're still getting a C, basically, um, but it's clear that performance, we have a knob now that changes your ability to see this stuff in depth, okay? And we can take it way down. In fact, we've gotten really diabolically good at this, and we can take people completely down to totally unable to see depth in this sort of display. So the fun thing then is if we ask those same human subjects looking at the same exact stimuli, the visual patterns, hey, what direction were those things moving in? That flat line means doesn't matter, okay? So regardless of whether you can see the depth, even when you can't really, you can still see the direction that this stuff is moving in, okay? And, and so, you know, the, the, there's, a, you know there's 40 other experiments that, that nail this. And I'd like to walk you through those now. No, um, you know, the, 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 the basic gist is just that we can really hamstring your ability to process, your brain's ability to process binocular information in the classical sense. But if stuff's moving, you can exploit this other source of information, right? And this was like a source of information 
that we sort of understand a lot about, visual motion processing, but that we hadn't brought into this domain of three-dimensional environments and binocular vision. Okay, so for me, this was actually the beginning of a puzzle that, that we're still working on. But just to sort of summarize this, again, in, in cheesy cartoon form, instead of just presenting simple patterns and moving them, say, to the left and to the right, if you really are willing to entertain the fact that the world has three dimensions and that you have two eyes, most of the time, when you're using binocular vision, what you're doing is figuring out what direction of motion the two eyes are seeing. You're not doing that spatial auto-stereogram magic eye thing. Okay, so you'll notice that the two eyes actually see opposite directions of motion whenever something moves purely towards and away. And it's that difference between the velocities, right, the directions, uh, that the brain uses for the vast majority of visual function. This has a horrible technical term. It turned out a few people had deigned to study this before us, and so it was already out there. But it's sort of fun to, fun to walk it through, right? The interocular, between the eyes, velocity difference, okay? In other words, the directions of motion are different in the two eyes. And, and that's a source of information that turns out to be really robust, okay? So one thing that, that I didn't mention early on, but that hopefully you, you've gotten your own sort of hints of, is that those, those autostereograms, the magic eyes, they're hard to see. You really have to dial it in, you need to concentrate, you need to keep your eyes still, they've gotta be just so, okay? And if I do something in the lab, like, turn black dots to white dots and white dots to black dots, you're toast, okay? You can't, you can't do it, okay? Visual motion, on the other hand, that's like an F-150, okay? You can just do anything and it keeps on going. Motion, motion detectors in your brain care about direction of motion. They don't care about how bright stuff is. They don't care if it's brighter than the background or darker than the background. They don't care if it's a face or a car or a bunch of dots moving, they send the same signal and they are really robust, right? So let me, let me tie a few loose ends together now, right? Um, at least for me, this turned out to be a really interesting puzzle, right? This notion of connecting two lines of research, both of which were quite mature, okay? Uh, visual system has been studied in humans and other animals. Uh, for hundreds of years, it's really the model for understanding brain function and information processing in the nervous system. And so it was really gratifying to start realizing that, that you know, there, there may be sort of important aspects of visual function that really require grafting two of these lines of work together. And, and what, what we've got a handle on now is that, in fact, for most of what you're doing, I'd argue not when you're threading a needle or maybe performing a brain surgery, but for most stuff you do, you're really relying not on that classical binocular vision, but instead on this motion-based way of seeing things in 3D. Now, it turns out there, there's a surprise application in this. And, and I was contacted by, by someone who is pretty much a, a pediatric ophthalmologist. Uh, and uh, his, he sent me a bunch of inc like laughably obscure papers, okay? so. Literally, the Quarterly Journal of Japanese Ophthalmology, which I understand is actually quite good, but you know, it's not something that, that I get at home, um, for example. Um, it turns out that um, many, uh, many pediatric ophthalmologists, a lot of what they field are kids coming in who have lazy eye. Okay, and, and, and this is actually a huge uh, public health issue. In the United States, it's, it's being mitigated a bit. There are corrective surgeries that can be done early on, uh, but sort of internationally, it's still a major, major deal. The issue is that if one of the eyes is misaligned with the other, that really precise system of binocular matching that I've been talking about doesn't develop properly. And unfortunately, if you then play with the eye muscles and dial them in to co-register the eyes, unless you do that early, it's kind of too late. The brain decides, I'm not gonna try to work with these two eyes. Instead, I'm gonna listen to the dominant one, or I'm gonna flip between the two semi-randomly, all right? But it turns out there's a vein of clinical literature uh, that was really fun to kind of learn about, um, which is that 
there are plenty of people who end up after being identified as what we call, you know, amblyopes, for example, that, that's the most common form of this, uh, and who, who are identified as stereo blind, in other words, don't fail depth perception tests, they can see in 3D. And there are varying degrees of sort of quality of seeing, and some of this is rather qualitative compared to the sort of you know quantitative stuff I, I've been featuring. But it, it turns out that all this classic sort of depth perception tests that are used, especially in uh, very early testing, are basically autostereograms. Okay, so they're very pure and precise, um, but they don't probe this other way of seeing with two eyes. And so um, starting to understand the, the sort of ability of different brains and different individuals to leverage their sort of binocular vision when, when things are moving, as opposed to just when they're staring at some sort of very strange ophthalmology test, um, ha has been something then that um, not only helped us make sense of a, a seemingly puzzling uh, sort of slice through the literature, this notion that there are a bunch of stereo blind people who can kind of clearly act in ways that suggest that they have some binocular vision. Um, but in fact, now the idea, because people are finally getting a little bit of sort of attraction on uh, training protocols that help uh, early amblyopes realign their eyes and see, the, the notion of, of actually being able to um, uh, get in there by using moving stimuli as opposed to hoping for that precise mechanism to kind of click back in uh, is, is something that several people have approached us about and, and we're starting to now sort of see this really fun, gratifying integration of literature where a few anecdotes out there in the clinical world, uh, a pile of uh, really curiosity-driven uh, uh, basic research uh, are now being uh, what I call translated, right? These are the people in between the basic researchers and the clinicians um, in ways to think about, well, what sorts of sort of eye training video games should we use? Well, they better involve moving stuff at least early on because that's one of the more robust systems and we can grab that as opposed to shooting for the stars and hoping for precise binocular disparity processing to, to sort of be, be rehabbed, all right? So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit, and I'm gonna to try to get out of that very dry laboratory experiment world a bit. And there, there were, in fact, and I don't have the time to really uh, get into this, there, there were a number of reasons why people in my lab were starting to try to come up with different ways of assessing visual function. And if you work with humans, you know that they're very smart, and if you give them a simple task, they try to make it complicated, right? These psych one students getting class credit for pressing buttons in your lab always have a theory that what you're really trying to do is scare them with the air conditioning noise or that there's a, you know, odor that they encountered a day before. Um, and no, you know, I just want you to look at the dots and press buttons. Um, likewise, if you work with animal models, right, if, if, if you work with non-human subjects, uh, you don't have the benefit of verbal instruction, and you train them only using positive reinforcement, right? They're an animal that you've sort of taken the responsibility of, so you're certainly not going to use punishment in trying to shape their behavior so that you can assess their, their perceptual performance. And so, you know, any, anyone who has kids knows that if you couldn't talk to them and if you couldn't use punishment, uh, it would be pretty slow going to shape the behavior. Uh, and, and, and so we were struggling with this in, in a lot of other technical ways too. Um, but we came up with a task that uh, thankfully doesn't require six to 18 months of slow training using conditioning protocols. And in fact, I would expect that almost all of you have been doing the task for us for a long time. So this display here um, is uh, actually now the bedrock of most of the experiments going on in the lab. Instead of telling you what you need to do, you're gonna see some visual motion, hold tight, just figure out what direction it's moving, and then later on, there's gonna be a buzzer that goes off, and that's when you move your eyes to a green spot on the right, something like that. Uh, we just put this up. We put it up, and you look at it. We don't tell you what to do with your eyes. We don't tell you what the goal is. And it turns out, I know you're, you're all wonderful individuals. You're all doing pretty much the same thing. And you're doing the same thing that like a marmoset would do. And that thing weighs a couple hundred grams. It's basically a squirrel, okay? 
So l l l let, me, let me unpack this for you. Turns out, behind the scenes, we are doing an experiment. Okay, this is um, virtual chicken wire. Um, each little patch of the screen is under our control. And I'm not gonna walk you through exactly what, but you can see that each one of those patches, even though they give rise to that sense of sort of flying through a snowfield or something like that, uh, is, is doing its own little wiggly thing, okay? They're all a little different and they turn on and off at different times. That just lets us sort of see the signature of each one of these contributing to stuff we measure. For example, what you do with your eyes when you're looking at this stuff. So now let me walk you through this. I'm now showing you the center of this expansion or contraction, okay? This hula hoop is just sort of an indicator of that's roughly where the center of this area is, okay, of this dynamic pattern. And that cyan cursor that you see just sort of jumping around, that's one subject's natural gaze pattern collected with zero instruction, okay? It's pretty good, okay? Remember, this black square and that hula hoop, they were not there on the screen, okay? Instead, we were just presenting these dots, no verbal instruction, and then as soon as the subject started looking at it, they naturally fixated on something very close to the center of that, what we'd call a flow field. This is actually not a deep insight in general, the center of that pattern would specify where you are heading. And so the, the idea that you know, any primate looks where they're going is, is not particularly deep or surprising, but the fact that the behavior right, that we can measure very easily is so good turned out to be really useful. And this is just a bit of a pleasant surprise. Sometimes we get these. So let, let me unpack this a little bit more. We can measure the relationship between that pattern and the subject's you know, sort of little movements of the eyes. For any individual, they'll all be a little different in what they're relying on uh, in a few minutes. It's great, right? Because they just do it so well and they just do it continuously and they do it for free and we don't have to give them breaks or anything like that, okay? And some people might rely just on stuff really close to where they're looking. Some kind of zone out and use the whole visual field. Some might be relying a little bit more on trajectory information as opposed to just exactly what's going on in that time. Uh, but it's easy to measure. We, we get a really solid handle of that in a few minutes. Okay? So then what we can do, in fact, is predict where the eyes should be for some other random pattern on the screen. So. What I'm gonna show you now is basically the same stuff. The cyan is the gaze of a subject, and that black circle now is our prediction of where the gaze should have been, just given what we knew we were gonna put up on the screen, okay? And so that took about five minutes of data, and so this is really nice, right? We realized, holy moly, in five minutes, I can sort of build a model, if you will, of how you look at this stuff and exactly where your eyes are gonna be. And you'll notice there, there are some subtle differences between our prediction and the gaze. The gaze is a little bit more staccato, right? It jumps and, and we understand that we just, this is the simplest thing to do. Um, and so there's still some interesting stuff here, but in general, for any one of these sort of moving patterns, we know where you're gonna put your eyes. All right, I know that sounds a little creepy, but it gets worse. So let me show you that, because I'm really into this one. So now, um, and in, in fact, this other know-it-all postdoc in the lab came up with this great idea all by himself. And he realized, well, if this behavior is so predictable, right, if it is so lawful, what if I present the same exact random stuff every now and then over and over again, okay? So, you know, every now and then, we just stop the movie, let the subject blink their eyes, do whatever they wanna do, um, and then start it over again. And what if we just started that movie over exactly the same way with the same exact dots in the same exact positions with the same exact sort of random walk of that center of, of the display over and over again? Trust me, you can't tell that's happening, okay? You're just zoning out, looking at these dots, okay? 
Um, but so, so here's what happens, okay? I'm gonna show you, you're, you're now familiar with the black square and, and the cyan circle, okay? You can actually sort of ignore those. Instead, you're gonna be viewing a single movie. That's a, a visual display that we presented many times. And each one of these little orange spots is our measurement of where the subject was looking on a different repetition of that same exact identical movie. Yeah. So here goes. It's great, it's a swarm of bees, right? So in general, over and over again, many minutes, many hours apart, subjects will look at the same exact spot and follow roughly the same exact temporal trajectory for really long amounts of time, okay? And, and this actually may not be that unintuitive either, Okay, in our world, it's, it's a really sort of fun tool. It helps us in, in basic research questions that I don't have the time to get into. But the, you know, if you've ever watched a good movie, right, uh, you know the director and the cinematographer are guiding what you're looking at. And they do it in sometimes subtle ways, they do it in sometimes very obvious ways. And it turns out, in fact, that there's a literature out there in cinema that has measured what people look at when they watch movies and really good, compelling parts of famous movies. Everybody in the theater is looking at the same stuff at the same time and shifting their gaze at the same time to the next same thing, okay? And, and so what, what's sort of powerful here is that this is totally under lab control. This is not a Hitchcock snippet, right? This is, in fact, as completely generic as possible, but it only operates within that little domain of function that we care about. If you can see these dots, you are going to move your eyes in a certain way. So now what I just want to do is tie this up with yet another little spin-off that turned into, in fact, a far bigger and broader bunch of clinical applications that, that are um, a little newer and, and are still going on, so I'm quite excited about them. Okay, so again, you know, I'm willing to admit, I just think this is cool. Um, there's a lot of other cool questions that this sort of behavioral paradigm lets us get at. Uh, and, and this notion that, you know, if you just put any sort of primate in front of visual motion, they're gonna look at the same stuff. That, that actually struck me as quite powerful. Um, but, but there's a surprise application here. So I, I happen to mention, if you can see the dots, your eyes are gonna do the same thing, okay? But if you can't see the dots, you're in big trouble in this task, right? You're not going to follow that center of the expanding or contracting field. You don't see anything, even though it might be up there. So it turns out that this, is a, um, this paradigm is, is really helpful for clinical vision testing, okay? Uh, I think the most intuitive application, although it's, uh, I think, one of the least exciting, um, is that of colorblindness, okay? So, um, if you are colorblind, there are certain different wavelengths that, that your uh, eyes are not good at distinguishing. The signals sent to the brain aren't sort of labeled by whether they're, say, red or green. Uh, and so if we presented those dots as red on a green background, anyone who's not colorblind is gonna be just fine. They're gonna do the same lawful stuff that I've already shown you. If they are colorblind, they're just kind of looking at this generic brown field. And maybe they're color anomalous, right? So they can see, get, eke out a little bit of wavelength information, but, but they don't have full color vision. And their performance is gonna be somewhere in between, okay? And I hid the quantitative aspects here, but we can put a number on how good you are at tracking quite easily, right? So, so you know, something like that is sort of fun. That was an obvious proof of concept. We actually had some people around who were colorblind. Um, but what's, what's really nice, in fact, is, is the practicality of this. So I mentioned that this happens for free, uh, ev even in non-human primates. So in fact, if you want to gauge visual function in a subject or an observer that you can't talk to, or that doesn't understand you, or that doesn't have the patience to perform boring visual tasks like we do in my lab, uh, you can just put this stuff up in front of them and make sure you're asking the right question, right? The, the 
Um, probably the most common form of, of visual testing that hopefully all of you have undergone is perimetry. That's that little, uh, you're, something's gonna flash on the screen somewhere and you squeeze that little paddle anytime you see it, right? What they're trying to make sure is that no part of your retina uh, has uh, essentially clocked out and stopped sending signals to the brain and that'll be spatially localized. So one can imagine just putting this sort of stimulus up and doing an assay on which parts of the visual field are driving the behavior. In a few minutes, you'd have a really nice estimate of that uh, without any instruction, without worrying that, well, maybe that subject wants to be really sure and so they don't like pressing the button. Or maybe they can't press buttons because they have a neurological disorder and you know it's hard to know whether they're pressing the button volitionally or there's some motor tremor, et cetera, right? So, so um, in pre-verbal children, if you wanna understand visual function early, um, before they can follow instructions and understand the task globally, this is the sort of task to use. So it's actually been really, really gratifying. A whole bunch of uh, sort of clinical researchers, translational types have picked up on this sort of paradigm and, and related ones that, that I've developed with colleagues here. Uh, and so in fact, uh, uh, at the University of Indiana, there's a whole bunch of visual function testing going on in infants using this sort of paradigm. It's really powerful because you can assess, you can throw a whole battery of visual tests at a critter, as long as, you know, at a person, as long as the little baby's eyes are open, you're, you're, you're gonna understand a lot really fast. Uh, University of British Columbia is doing a lot of this work in patients. Uh, so uh, if you have a, a neurological disorder, there are often visual and visual function deficits too. Those, those can be very helpful for figuring out exactly what form of a clinical issue is up. Uh, and, and so we've been, we've been sort of sharing the approach with them. Uh, and then at the University of Colorado, that's a, a very hardcore neurosurgical application where they need to understand during a surgery uh, which parts of the brain are integrating certain types of information. And, and uh, you know, this is very high stakes. They're amazing. Um, again, I'm not that kind of doctor, but uh, uh, they, they use this paradigm primarily not for the visual aspect of it, but just for the speed at which you can learn a lot quantitatively. Uh, and so, so with that, I, I'm, uh, uh, hopefully I have acclimated you to uh, sort of my depth of being willing to just follow puzzles uh, because I'm now gonna take it to the next level and I'm gonna conclude soon just by really showing you a movie and talking about it a bit. Uh, there are many primates. Almost all primates have a nice primary visual cortex and a nice area MT. It's like stock. If you're a primate, you've got an MT, it works the same. This critter here, now in slow motion, is an amazing hunter. It's called a tarsier. It weighs about 150 grams, so this is a tiny little thing. And you can see, at this point, target acquired, right? It goes and it gets this bug on the first try. These are amazing visual hunters. They have primary visual cortex, they have visual area MT, but they appear to be lacking something that is really striking. So one thing that I mentioned early on that I haven't had the time to get into is that a huge chunk of your brain, if you're a primate, is just dedicated to processing the information from the eyes. About a third of it is just figuring out what you're looking at, okay? The thinking parts of the brain, those are pretty small, okay? They're important, it's, you know, why, you know, why we're having this discussion and why Planet of the Apes movies are upsetting. Uh, but um, another big, big chunk of your brain, we think, is just there to figure out what to look at next and how to actually yank on the eye muscles, which are complicated and beautiful, to shift the gaze in the right way. We're very visual animals, okay? This is different in rodents, where their whiskers and their sense of smell are highly developed, and not a lot of brain does pure visual processing or figures out where to move the eyes. Now, if you've been checking this guy out, there's something weird, right? He's moving his head. He, he doesn't seem to be moving his eyes. Yeah. He's moving his ears like nobody's business. But he doesn't seem to be moving his eyes. 
In fact, his eyes, each eye is larger than its brain, and the eyes are shaped like light bulbs jammed into sockets or like pears poking out of the, the skull, okay? They don't look like balls that can just spin easily in the eyes, okay? So we have a great anthropology department here. I had lunch with a friend who's the world's foremost expert on the shape of the eye orbits uh, in non-human primates in the fossil record. We were at Madame Mams, and I just asked him, oh, hey, have you ever heard of tarsiers? Can they move their eyes? And it got weird, it got quiet. He said, like, we need to talk. We should go back to my office. <laughs> we went back to his office, and he said, that's the holy grail of physical anthropology in primates. <laughs> I was like, yeah, funny, like, what's up? Um, so, yeah, it turns out that um, there's a huge debate out there about whether tarsiers move their eyes. And the reason why it's important is not just that they're very compelling, right? Uh, but that they turn out to have a really, really interesting and debated position in the evolutionary tree. There is a uh, passionate debate about really whether they are monkeys or prosimians, which are like the dumb little primates. Uh, and, and it turns out that they are, um, although rather geographically restricted nowadays in the fossil record, they were sort of the kings of the primate world for a long time. In fact, this colleague of mine digs up what are basically tarsiers in West Texas, okay? So they've been all over, even though now they're very restricted. So in fact, we've got this joint project, again, I'm willing to admit, curiosity-driven, that is really just trying to answer the question, can these primates move their eyes at all? There's a 1964 German monograph that's been translated and says, I don't think they move their eyes much. And that is the state of the art. Uh, so in fact, we're gonna go and we're gonna do field work. And we're gonna go measure their eye position and we're gonna understand quantitatively just how good they are because we've got a handle now on how primate visual function, thanks to, say, the stuff I just talked about in the last little module, um, guides the gaze shifts of animals with respect to three-dimensional visual movement. And so what we first need to do, of course, is find these critters and see if they can move their eyes at all. Um, and so the immediate real-world relevance is simply that I get to go to Borneo, um, and, and I'm really not above that. But the other big thing here is that, in fact, this is a species that can see really well, and they can see visual motion really well. We've got that great YouTube video that I just showed you of that, okay? Um, but they appear not to do it by making at least normal eye movements. If they make eye movements, they're really small, okay? And I'll measure those if they're there, I promise. Instead, though, they've got a standard primate brain. So all that stuff we thought in the primate brain is involved in taking visual information and figuring out where to move the eyes has to be more general purpose than that, okay? There may be specialized structures that actually tug on the eye muscles. Those are pretty well understood. But a lot of the stuff that we thought was eye movement shifting probably has more to do with figuring out how to interrogate a visual scene in a more generic sense, okay? Some of this may actually just be head movement. They clearly do that. But a lot of this could even be covert, right? We can all shift our attention without moving our eyes. And in fact, the sort of blurry line between moving one's eyes and shifting one's attention is a long-standing debate. And so I think what we've done is actually happened upon a model system that by accident and by quirk and by an amazing tunneling through YouTube videos that, that got me hooked on this species um, it is actually going to provide a lot of uh, insight into how the brain plans movement. And if you understand where and how the brain plans movement and you can record those signals, you can do a lot of really powerful things, okay? This is actually at the heart of brain-computer interface. If you've ever seen a joystick or a robotic arm moved, uh, by brain control. These are basically the first applications of very rudimentary understanding, admittedly, of the parts of the brain that don't really do the motor act, 
but which planet? And so this hopefully is gonna be a powerful sort of complementary view and a tool, if you will, um, in starting to understand intention uh, separated from the usual motor actions that, that are part of that and are realized. Uh, so just to wrap up real quick, puzzles are fun, I like them. Uh, I hope somehow you've been somewhat sort of interested in some of this too, um, but it, it's totally fine if the majority of you, uh, majority of people out there really find it much more important, much more gratifying for there to be real world, especially clinical applications of, of biological research, I get it. Um, and, and so uh, really my goal here um, was, was to show that even someone who is almost intentionally sort of working in an abstract domain, um, that basic understanding is a, often a scaffolding for um, applications. And, and the, in many ways, the, some of the most compelling applications out there, which are not the ones I've talked about, but, but are you know, other people's expertise, came out of even more obscure and esoteric studies. I mean, studying jellyfish ha has led to some of the most powerful tools um, in, in, in biology nowadays. And that was a real sort of, oh, wait a sec, sort of moment. Um, and, and, and so, you know, m my sort of perspective on this is that you have to be really good at what you do, and you can only be good at so much. And so um, the division of labor thing really pays off in science. And so for me, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that my strengths lie in curiosity-driven research. Some of my favorite scientists are people who can take that basic understanding and say, this could be useful. And then there's this whole world of people who take that stuff and say, let's really try to turn that into a clinical study. And, and so hopefully I've, I've given you a little sense sort of of the, the structure of the scientific process, but um, I am more than happy at this point now to um, open the discussion up. We can talk about anything. So I'll turn things back over to Mike while I put up the uh, advertisement for the next one. Cool. Yeah, thanks.